Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, everyone, uh, and welcome to this edition of Urology 60 Minutes coming from uh, USC's Keck School of Medicine. Uh, today, we have a, a, a fairly exciting and interesting topic on uh, current options for uh, surgical management of a large prostate uh, with BPH. And uh, I'm very privileged to have a distinguished uh, faculty with us today. Our invited speaker, uh, Dr. Kevin Zorn, is a faculty member at the University of Montreal. Uh, Kevin has been a leader in minimally invasive surgery with uh, both robotic and endoscopic surgery, especially in terms of BPH. He's uh, uniquely positioned for this, this conference because he's got firsthand uh, uh, initial experience with the, all three techniques that we would be talking about. Uh, also, I have with me uh, Dr. Rene Sotelo, who is a professor of urology at USC. Um, Today's program, we will cover essentially three uh, minimally invasive options that are recently uh, being utilized uh, for managing larger prostates. Um, I'm not gonna give a volume definition of what is large that I think varies per physician, um, but anything that you would think a TURP in your hands is unreasonable. Um, Dr. Kevin Zorn will give a presentation about uh, laser enucleation, uh, focusing on both the green light as well as the homeum uh, techniques. Uh, I will talk about aquablation, and Dr. Sotelo will then conclude by his talk on robotic simple prostatectomy. And then uh, time permitting, uh, in the final 15 minutes, we have a, a bit of a panel discussion uh, uh, in order to kind of compare and contrast. So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Kevin Zorn from Montreal to give his talk on laser nucleation. Thank you, Mahir. Thank you, uh, distinguished guests as well, and uh, my co-fellow uh, faculty. Dr. Gill as well, and uh, my colleagues. Uh, let's see if I can open up my slides. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Can you guys see my screen here? I just asked to share a screen. We're good? Perfect. Yes, right. we so, uh, I was deeded the tasks of uh, wearing my hat for nucleation. So uh, as mentioned, I've been fortunate in my career to have, uh, let's see if I can advance slide. There we go. So here are my disclosures. Some work with Boston Scientific with Resume and Greenlight, and some work with Aquablation, some of the new upcoming Zenflow and Optronic uh, with Optilum. And my, my, my background dates back to being a, 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 a young one working with Dr. Al Halali, getting introduced into the world of BPH through Holup. So imagine doing six months of Holup and then going to do your first Herc. That was the way I was introduced to BPH. So uh, being engraved very early on of the principles of finding anatomic planes. And I think Dr. Gill smiling, he uh, being a pioneer in surgery and understanding even the micro uh, and an anatomic planes is so essential for good outcomes. So here's my experience from working with green light, hole up, uh, some of the advanced techniques of this an anatomic uh, dissection, uh, green lep and other nucleation modalities. And in, in essence, it's the same thing, but the energy choice is uh, variable. Some work with aquablation and some of the new mist from Eurolift to resume and some robotic prostatectomy. So I'd like to start off, I'm glad I'm starting, because in 2020, you know, this is what we know for BPH. The options, it's unlike uh, appendicitis or other types of diseases where there may be one option, we have a large number and growing list of different modalities, be it medical, surgical, or some of the missed options. And as jobs as urologists, we have a lot more discussion with our patients to trend the risks and benefits. Second, DRE, you know, we all have stethoscopes, we all have a finger, but it's very unreliable, especially for prostates over 50 grams. And we'll get into some of the volume outcomes later. But as we can see here from Henry Wu looking at DRE, once you get past 50 grams, the sensitivity specificity falls off the mark. Use of ultrasound. So I think we've still seen as, as of late the greater use of handheld ultrasonography and uh, transrectal seems to be you know, the standard. Uh, I've adopted uh, a handheld uh, Clarius ultrasound, which matches up well with your iPhone. And on the spot, during your cysto, during your evaluation of the patient, you can clearly demarcate if there's a medial lobe, you get a sense of urethral length if you're in mists. Uh, you have the options with color Doppler and elastrography. This is something else I'm looking at to see outcomes. But here you can see a wonderful example, a referral for 60 gram prostate. And guess what? He's 130. So that's a slightly off the mark uh, assessment tool. And I think the treatment options for that size prostate may be different than what we were referred. The guidelines, there's been major changes as of late and we can see here most uh, echoing the EAU and uh, CUA and EAU, 
all fall in the lines that, as you can see in the red arrow, that outcomes uh, and procedure techniques are going to be based on volume. So when we talk about large prostates, typically over 80 grams, open prostatectomy, some of the, ro and the robotic growing, with Dr. Stella will share on that, enucleation, tissue removal, uh, have all been added uh, to the armamentarium. One thing that's unique, and we'll, we'll talk about with some of the lasers, is another chunk, uh, another bucket of patients, the anticoagulated. So those who are uh, at prone risk, high risk, frail patients who are anticoagulated, they also should be considered slightly different and may have different needs. TERP is still the workhorse. We all know we can go to conferences, we hear about all these unique techniques, but most urologists out in practice are still doing TERP. Uh, we have a larger likelihood of undertreating and just creating a channel. And we know that if you use bipolar, there's been publications by Dr. Gleebet shown that you still can do a good job. It's an endoscopic technique and most surgeons who do a lot of other treatments, bipolar or monopolar seems to do the trick. What is large? And uh, Mahir mentioned that, you know, the number is not, no longer what it used to be. It used to be considered 80 plus and based on the new guidelines, there's no size specific cutoff. But if we look at the literature, typically around 80 to 100 is where most publications cut the draw, draw the line for large prostates. And that's important, I guess, because typically one hour has been the mantra that whenever you do TERP, you're supposed to get your done, surgery done. So that marks off average resection of a TERP is 1.5 to 2 grams per minute. We're looking at around an hour at around 100 grams. And we know from Greenlight, some of the work Dr. Huber and all uh, we published on looking at the outcomes 100 gram prostates tend to be around an hour's worth of laser PVP. So the whole dilemma, what are the challenges with large prostates? They're long surgeries, be it open prostatectomy, PVP, HOLEP, we can see here on the, on the left, the, the OR time sur surpasses one hour, some up to two or maybe even three hours. And with bigger prostates come bigger transfusion risks, TERP syndrome, surgical revision, so this is uh, some of the work from Oliver Reich looking at the Bavarian analysis of over 10,000 patients. And the other aspect is skill and equipment. Fellowship or additional training and special equipment with special costs also are limitations of access to this care. And this is some of the publications we looked at among the 13 Canadian sites looking at 2018 outcomes. What are residents being trained with? We can see monopolar and open prostatectomy. All 13 programs are doing it. There's still a good number of opportunity for residents to be trained on green light. But if you look at a nucleation, there's only a small percentage offered. So less than one out of four residents will have access to knowledge and technique. And we also looked at how many OSPs are being done a year in Canada, 4.7. So that's for a whole program over a one year period. So I don't think all residents are properly or equally trained. And that's part of the issue of moving forward. Uh, robotic techniques, there are some being done, and I think there's ample evidence to show that we do make differences in outcomes and uh, the standard IPSS and quality life and QMAX. Uh, we know that it is a longer technique compared to open prostatectomy. Uh, we're able to reduce by twofold the blood loss, but there's still length of stay and length of catheter, which remain high. And being as a Canadian too, looking at cost, one of the inhibitors for me to do this is on all cases is that the cost economics doesn't work out uh, particularly with uh, additional costs for the equipment. So it is something that's most familiar. We're all doing radical prostatectomy. So it's very easy to, transit to transition into a robot assisted simple prostatectomy. But additionally costs are uh, incorporated and there's additional skin, abdomen, intestine and bladder which have to be you know, injured, let's say, to, to get access to the prostate. So being a robotic guy and you know, from the days of notes, natural orifice or minimally invasive, the idea of an incisionless surgery, uh, I think, was way to go. And I guess I threw this in to add a little comedy, but if we look at the uh, third, uh, uh, Greta Thurnton with the idea of carbon footprint, we know as we move forward, this is going to be something that's going to be more and more talked about. The numbers of growing, and we know that when you do robotic surgery, the carbon footprint is greater than 75% compared to open techniques. So certainly, we need to be aware and cognizant of that especially with all the COVID masks and stuff that waste that we're doing these days. Uh, HOLEP, we know is, is, I don't need to profess, I think everyone who practices urology has heard amply the data that a nucleation really cures BPH. You really get the entire transition zone removed and the durability is there. The 97 and 95% freedom from surgery for BPH. And most of those surgeries tend to be from strictures, 
probably from the larger morselators that were used at that time. Uh, but we know from the work of Gilling and Al-Halali, Lingaman, it's something that requires additional learning curve, a large number of cases. It's kind of scary when you see these numbers. And if you're out in community practice doing, you know, a case or two a week, it's hard to get that number. So you don't have the, uh, the case volume to get there. Um, this is some of the work that's been published showing that learning curve. And if you're in practice already, you want to adopt HOLEP or any enucleation technique, it's something that has been shown in these large uh, nine center training with Dr. Lucas that only about 44% continue to maintain it. So most often, if you are gonna embark on a nucleation, you need to do your mentorship uh, with either Dr., uh, you know, the leaders or some of their disciples as part of a fellowship training. And that tends to be the case. Uh, the other things that are inhibitory or difficult with a nucleation is the reimbursement factor. If you look at what one, one would make for comparative to a laser prostatectomy, a PVP, to a nucleation, the numbers are not as favorable. And from a hospital standpoint, you're not bringing in as much to compensate for the additional equipment. So you need to do a secondary surgery using secondary equipment, including the Morse later and nephroscope, as we see here on the right. So uh, the other factor that sometimes scares people, aside from the potential complications of Morse later, is the transient incontinence. I think this has evolved and gotten better, especially with on block enucleation. But in the past, we know that because of the mechanical separation of the adenoma from the capsule, there is some inadvertent apical injury, uh, which may require some work with a physiotherapist and it tends to improve with time. So getting into a nucleation and especially laser, I think the type of patients we see from our, you know, standard on the left, a young man who like from a radical prostatectomy, young men, we're seeing more of these elderly patients. Top right, you can see the life expectancy. A hundred years ago, most people didn't live to 50. Now we're seeing men in their 80s and 90s. And with that, our friends, the cardiologists, also like giving DOAC anticoagulation medication. So those numbers are going up. So the type of patient, I'm sure we're all in this web, webinar are seeing, we're seeing a lot more older and anticoagulated men. So at least in my experience, in my practice, the green light has that versatility that you can offer a wide variety of different techniques, be it the nucleation, or some of the uh, vaporization or hybrid technique. Uh, and I think that's the true endoscopic durable outcomes and we'll cover some of that and manageable for various size prostates, especially the anticoagulated. The green light has that wavelength preference that allows for a coagulative necrosis and allows these patients as outpatient surgeries. And we've seen improvements in the power, you know, the generation that we have now is version three. So we've gone through several, but the XPS fiber is something that's more durable we're able to accelerate surgeries by about 30% faster to OR times. And being a good Canadian, we're able to keep usually one fiber per case up, to around, up until around 130 gram prostates. Uh, Dr. Hubert Renal has published with me on this, looking at once you start going over 80 grams, you can do this, but it takes longer. So the PVP aspect is something that takes longer operative times. Uh, and then in order to get good outcomes, we're supposed to use 40 kilojoules per cc. And at six months, based on some of the previous work by Lebdi and all, a 50% reduction in PSA is what our goal should be. Those who failed, who, who didn't do well, didn't tend to get the four kilojoules per gram and their PSA reduction fell very short of 50%. So we published on not only PVP, but also taking that to a nucleation like an anatomic dissection from our initial work uh, to more recent, where we're able to use the fiber, just like in a nucleation, and using that wavelength to carve through the adenoma in a very hemostatic method, find the capsule, and then fire along the capsule. So what we're gonna be seeing here is the non-contact, unlike holop, you need to have direct contact with the fiber, where here we're using the 70 degree offset of the green light to fire along the capsule, uh, or the adenoma to get to capsule, which we're gonna see momentarily. So this is about 120 gram prostate that we're doing, and it done, being done as an outpatient surgery. So you know, you're not getting the same bleeding you would get for a, a pure nucleation. And then once we get to that capsule, I don't move this fast, obviously this is a sped up video, but once we find that capsule, we're gonna be like our finger firing along tangential, uh, obviating the puncture or perforation of the capsule uh, and getting that adenoma onto a stalk to which we'll then chop off into smaller pieces and avoid, avoid a morselator. So this is that idea of anatomic vaporization following the same principles of enucleation, but using the laser more steadily through, uh, throughout the procedure and getting out small pieces. We're averaging around 10 grams of tissue, so we avoid the morse later 
something that's easy to, to adapt and to learn and to practice, and especially in those older anticoagulated men, we can tackle and to offer them same day surgery. So these patients are going home with their catheter and removing them the next day, but not staying the night in the hospital. So again, this is a you know, opportunity to treat patients even with small stones. We're able to use um, that tissue removal for uh, concerns of any prostate cancer and obviously allow their catheter to be removed usually within the next day uh, as an outpatient surgery. And here you can clearly see the defect from that anatomic vaporization. Uh, we published on this as well. If you just do PVP or it uses anatomic vaporization to get a nucleation like defects, we're able to get more uh, significant reductions uh, for this 80 to 83 gram prostate uh, quality life, Qmax, PVR, and as well the PSA reduction, which reflect on the amount of tissue removed, are superior with this technique. Uh, we're able to also uh, get less hospital and uh, ER uh, visits thereafter uh, treatment as well. And we uh, annotate this to uh, better hemostasis and less coagulative necrosis uh, charring that would be seen with PVP uh, that some patients uh, tend to have more dysuria. And the durability is there. We published on our five and uh, your outcomes and retreatment rate of 1.1%. But you're still going to get those prostates. We talked about spectrums from 30 grams. You'll see some prostates at 300 grams. Do, is this the right technique? No. Uh, we've looked at our studies of PVP and even vaporization. Uh, we can see that these type of larger prostates, over 200 grams, are going to take well over two hours of surgery, 2.6 fibers. At, you know, Canadian standards at a thousand bucks of fiber, it doesn't add up. So in this wide spectrum of prostate volumes that we see, you know, these larger prostates tended to have higher failure rate at three years. So we've moved away from that and moved to a nucleation. So that idea of doing bigger prostates, it can be done, but the question is, are there other alternatives? And so the idea born of a nucleation uh, has been grown. So I think green light, green lep is the, the new acronym amongst the other acronyms for EEP, enucleation to prostate, combines the marriage of mechanical enucleation, and that's where the skill comes in, the laser assistant for hemostasis, and finally the morselation. So it's actually three principles of these EEP, and I think the, the marriage of the 532 nanometer wavelength with more modern morselators allow for uh, superior and safer outcomes. Um, so this is something that's when, from the work of Dr. Sanchez, Gomez Sanchez, uh, out of Spain, some of his work in Bulgaria. And here you can see the rounder tip fiber doing the initial dissection um, and a lot less, uh, especially doing having done whole up, the benefit of green lap is I think you're able to, as you can see, do your work from a distance. You don't need to be right up against the tissue and you can get a much better hemostasis for outpatient surgery. And they on block a nucleation while a nucleation is a nucleation is a nucleation, as Dr. Herman always likes to say, but I have a sense and from my own personal experience, I think we have a lot less trauma at the apex with a non-contact fiber and the 70 degree offset at laser energy that's transmitted. So we're able to protect the pericollicular tissue and avoid injury to the vera montanum, which is important to ejaculation. But as, as was mentioned before, the difficulty is getting more equipment. We need different equipment unique to a nucleation, you'll need the blunt tip 24 resectoscope. We prefer the wolf. And this is some of the work uh, from Dr. Vincent Misrai, one of my mentors came to train us. And using some of the different equipment, we've had even easier outcomes and a faster learning curve. And the piranha morselator makes night and day difference compared to the previous morselators, especially with the disposable uh, uh, blades. We're able to resect and morselate a heck of a lot more tissue as from seen here, the morselation time for these over 100 gram prostates was six minutes. Uh, much different than the previous where you're, you know, after one hour of nucleation, you're spending 30 minutes morselating. So I think we have safer and better morselators, which lend to that. And as I conclude here, I'm going to come to the, you know, what is the best treatment for BPH for large prostates? There's our side of the story. I want to be fast. I want to be easy to learn and bring into my practice. It should bring some, you know, financial benefit uh, and, and have low complications. And we're able to use this in a versatility of type of patients in the elderly and the anticoagulated, which is a unique group of patients. Uh, to the patients, they just want to have no complications. And more and more, we're hearing about the sexual and ejaculatory function. And we're looking at a tool right now to measure these to help us, the urologists, in our platform and understanding patients, what their expectations are, especially with durability. So here is my, you know, what I use in my practice and giving it to my patients. You know, what are, when we're going through the portfolio, the menu, 
uh, of options, here's the list that you can have for large prostates, including aquablation, robotic technique, green light, and some of the MIST techniques. And we have to go through all of these and go through them with them. So, um, you know, in the current era, I think, you know, uh, robotic is another technique. And I think especially in the larger prostates, especially with those with stones and so forth, um, diverticula, we're able to tackle these that we would not do with just pure laser. But I think we're pushing more and more toward natural orifice surgery with less invasive, faster recovery, and as well thinking of costs. So uh, I think that it, part of our job is to understand our, our availability, our, our knowledge base, our equipment, um, and to bring in a nucleation. And my practice, and especially in those prostates, over 150 grams, uh, where we can do outpatient surgeries uh, and have less uh, catheter time uh, while trying to preserve uh, sexual function with the energy, uh, the, the short wavelength of the laser. So the downside, unfortunately, still remains a learning curve and requires mentorship and the additional equipment and lack of a benefit of a, you know, the reimbursement factor for these extra skills that are taught. So with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. And I'll pass the, the, the baton over to, I think, Dr. Satello, who will take the lead. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, maybe now, um, I will now uh, present a second um, uh, in, in, uh, but newer um, trans urethral technique that I think has a, a lot of promise for large volume BPH and which may address some of the uh, uh, downsides that uh, Kevin mentioned with the laser based uh, trans urethral enucleation techniques. So, I'm going to have my slide up. So what I'll be talking about is uh, aquablation, uh, and again, as it relates to um, larger prostate glands. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I'm a consultant with Procept, which is a company that makes the uh, aquablation system, and I was a, a co-PI of the Water 2 uh, study. What this is, is a transurethral procedure that uses a calibrated, automated, high-pressure water jet to resect uh, the adenoma tissue uh, under real-time transrectal ultrasound guidance. So it is uh, completely based on a physical um, uh, a resection on, a, on the water pressure. And uh, unlike most other transurethral procedures, does not rely on any thermal aspect for, for uh, it, it's, it to work. And this is a little cartoon video of how it works. This is a transurethral um, handpiece that goes in, that is mounted on a, on a bed-mounted arm. Uh, the patient generally is either in spinal or general anesthesia, and a truss probe has already been inserted and mounted onto the arm. Uh, the workstation is fairly simple, and there are a few measurements that need to be taken both in the transverse view as well as in the sagittal view. Uh, the transverse view basically uh, gives you the angle of sweep of the water jet. It's almost like a windshield wipe. Uh, the bigger the gland, the wider that angle is. And then the sagittal view gives you the depth and the contour of resection. So you can see these landmarks fairly quickly. So you register not just the prostate, but also the, the handpiece itself. Um, and there are certain zones, the green zone, which is the bladder neck zone, where you can have a different power or a different angle to protect the bladder neck fibers. And a similar zone is included for the Veru uh, Montanum. And based on your cystoscopic assessment of how long the Veru uh, and ejaculatory ducts are, uh, you can preserve that at six o'clock, which is one of the mechanisms by which it, it preserves um, ejaculatory function. And, and the water jet then uh, in one pass goes from the bladder to the apex, causing the uh, resection of the tissue. Uh, as seen here on the, on the transverse view, you basically uh, uh, can adjust the angle of sweep just to make sure that the water jet edge does not go beyond the capsule. And similarly on the, on the, on the vertical section, you kind of uh, denote where each of the um, uh, landmarks are so that it can accurately go deep enough. Uh, and in case you feel that the prostate is large and you need, uh, and the water jet did not go there, you can do a second pass. And under real time uh, truss, you can actually see the hyperechoic leading a water jet uh, uh, stream. And you can make sure that it actually corresponds to what you feel is the contour to be resected. And there is a ability in real time to reduce or increase the power of the water jet. And as I mentioned, if you feel that there is a certain portion of the prostate that did not uh, get treated, you can do what is called a second or a third pass, which is not uncommon in these larger glands. And as you can see here, uh, the um, water jet uh, does reach the desired uh, marked area. And you can actually see in real time 
the fluid from the bladder going in and 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 occupying the fossa uh, in the cystoscopic view you can only see uh, the landmarks before you do the treatment to get get oriented and also the very last apical portion um, of the treatment so this is more a uh, faith on the uh, real time imaging which is another unique aspect of this pph procedure this is a, a little a cystoscopic view of a pre and a post so that's a uh, a bilobar uh, hypertrophy and, and a, a slightly elevated bladder neck on the left and that's the veru and this is a cystoscopy done immediately after the aqua ablation you can see that the the fossa is nice and wide and open and you can see this fluffy white tissue which is the collagenous vasculature as it comes from the capsule that does not get disturbed because this is tissue selective it only selectively resects adenoma and leaves anything with high collagen which is the uh blood vessels as well as the uh prostate capsule intact and which is one of the reasons why in many of these cases simple catheter traction alone uh, achieves hemostasis because the oozing is at the end of these capillary vessels and not at the level of the capsule as what occurs in resective or enucleative uh, type procedures and so specific hemostatic measures are not routinely required now i'm going to go on to data so the pivotal uh, regulatory study was a randomized control trial between aquablation and turp this was a 2 is to 1 randomization and even though the volume restriction was 30 to 80 because uh, we didn't want the study to be uh, favorable towards aquablation because turp is not considered standard for glands above 80 it does give you important insights of the utility of this technique for larger glands and as can be expected with the randomized trial uh, the i baseline ips score the percent median lobes as well as the baseline uh, peak flow rates were comparable between the aquablation and the turp group the primary uh, safety endpoint was a 3 month cla persistent clavian dindo 1 or clavian dindo 2 and higher events and in which case aquablation therapy was actually superior to turp for the overall events but if you remove the clavian dindo 1 uh, persistent 1 events which was basically ejaculatory and sexual dysfunction events the remaining higher grade complications were fairly comparable between the two groups for the entire cohort uh as kevin mentioned ejaculatory function sexual function is being increasingly uh, noticed to be important in men who select their bph therapy and for ejaculatory function as measured by the uh, ejaculatory domain of the mshq uh, aquablation therapy again was found to be superior uh, to turp in this randomized trial the primary efficacy endpoint was a 6 month reduction in ips scores and aquablation was found to be non inferior to turp for the entire cohort um, at the 6 month mark and we saw similar trends with both the uh, peak flow rates as well as the post void um, residues hemoglobin loss was also comparable and so was transfusion between the aquablation and turp now here is where it gets relevant to the large volume prostates when a sub analysis of the greater than 50 g prostates was done uh, even though the primary safety endpoint was superior with aquablation for the entire cohort even the primary efficacy endpoint was superior with aquablation compared to turp and not just non inferior for these larger prostates so the bigger the prostates the safety as well as efficacy profiles were better and this is why because as kevin has mentioned many tran most transurethral procedures are volume dependent and as you can see on the left if you plot operative time to prostate volume uh, as the volume gets larger the operative time um, uh, gets greater but if in aquablation which is the graph on the right you will see that the line is much more flat meaning this is volume independent and each of the dots for the resection time are clustered around the mean suggesting that there is very little variability in uh, operative time between surgeons between surgeons compared to turp on the left where the dots are all over the place uh, meaning that you know uh, if, uh, surgical expertise and skill significantly uh, impacts the efficiency of the procedure and based on this uh, the uh, a second phase study was started which was an, a single arm open label study looking at prostates bit, uh, greater than 80 and less than 150 grams uh, and uh, these results have actually now been updated to the 2 year mark but these were 101 patients uh, uh, again severely obstructed average prostate volume was about 100 and 7 cc and the vast majority of these had some intravesical uh, component uh, most of these were spinal anesthetics uh, the total uh, time for the procedure again was very efficient uh, for these larger prostates where uh, the hand piece in and out time was only 37 minutes and the actual resection time is 8 minutes so 
So one of the benefits here is that given that the actual resection is automated and image guided, the, the main component of the time is for surgical planning. And so whether you plan this treatment out for a, a 30 cc prostate versus a 100 cc prostate, the time change is not that much, even though you may do more than one pass. And so this is a, a very efficient procedure and volume independent. Uh, based on the protocol, most of these patients had a Foley catheter in for three days. The majority had an overnight stay in the hospital. And, and just again, as a, 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 a decision by the investigators, all of these were done where there was no formal uh, cautery hemostasis done at the end of the procedure. In this trial, uh, we think now that that's a mistake and there is a, a subset of patients who will benefit from doing a cystoscopic fulguration at the end of the procedure. The primary safety endpoint was met. The objective uh, performance cutoff at 65% of the upper level of the uh, confidence interval. Uh, this was 45.5, which is lower than that. So thereby meeting its uh, primary safety endpoint. And these are the breakdown of the complications per uh, clavian Rindo uh, criteria. I'd like to spend a little time on the bleeding events because that is a concern. And we did see uh, in, this, in this cohort that there were um, six transfusions in the immediate post-operative period and four transfusions in the delayed phase between uh, discharge to uh, one month. And there were uh, <clears throat> four instances of return to the operating room for either placement of a catheter or clot evacuation or cystoscopic fulguration. And I do feel that some of these events can be minimized by paying good attention to the color of the urine at the end of the procedure and actually using selective cautery in case there is a vessel that has been disrupted at the capsule rather than uh, a card blanche doing a a thermal technique in all the single patients. Uh, IPSS again similarly improved as we saw with water uh, one study, so did the Euroflow rates and uh, uh, post void residues. Now, an important difference between this and transurethral enucleative procedures that Kevin mentioned is that the learning curve for this is very, very low. In fact, nine of the 16 sites with these large volume water two a trial had no prior experience, and the average number of cases done per surgeon was only four and the median prior experience was 0.5, meaning the, and the results were fairly consistent across surgical sites. Therefore, the uh, individual skill level does not impact uh, the outcomes too much. Again, looking at the bleeding overview, uh, coll collating all the trials, 364 patients, some of which did use selective cauterization, some did not use cauterization. What we found, the volume of the prostate was the only predictor for bleeding events, as you would expect and the overall transfusion and return to the OR rate in this retrospective study was 2.5%. And a more recent updated study from Germany by Thorsten Bach from a single institution uh, using um, a selective cauterization at the end in 320 plus patients saw a bleeding rate of 1.9%. So this is a work in progress and improvements have been made. It is part of the AUA 2019 surgical practice guidelines, yet because of the randomized trial restricted at 80 grams, it is still indicated for that volume, but the, the subsequent study and the follow-up indicate its use. And I think that's where the true benefit is in the larger glands. So to summarize, it is a safe and effective procedure for treatment of symptomatic BPH. Uh, there is really no anatomic or size limitation uh, for this prostate. Um, it does better preserve ejaculatory function uh, compared to TURP. Uh, it is time efficient for larger prostates and especially with a very low learning curve. So uh, unlike an enucleative procedure, it does not require an aggressive mentorship program and can be done by surgeons with limited um, uh, experience. But the future direction is going to be a better hemostasis uh, for patients with larger glands. And in that event, I would like to say that folks who are on anticoagulants or who are likely to get on anticoagulants fairly quickly, uh, this is something that you should be cautious in not using. Uh, and I think a laser-based procedure is likely to be uh, more advantageous. Again. Uh, thank you for the attention, and I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Sotelo for the robotic simple prostatectomy, and then we can visit these uh, issues, and we'll have a few questions and discussions comparing techniques at the end. Uh, wow, Mihir, thank you again for, for the opportunity. I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, reviewing all the new uh, options and it looks very exciting this aquablation technology and well congratulations because you've been pioneering these uh, new approaches 
basically we have now 12 years that we have described the robotic approach and basically the open it's very important that the open surgical approach remind the gold standard uh, for more than 100 years and that's why even that we have found all these new options for really big big prostates it always uh, open access uh, reminds the gold standard it's very important that um, when we approach the the uh, the different option of treatments that is not only that we resect some tissue that we open a nice channel is that we need to try to extract uh, as much tissue as possible. And, and when we compare to open, the highest amount of the highest percent of extracted prostate is the open approach. That's why um, the, um, the, the options and the retreatment rates is higher with all the other endoscopic procedures. It's very important that um, sometimes you don't, we don't mention it, but uh, there's some other side effects also for the endoscopic procedures. As we go close to the capsule, we have more chance of risk of creating erectile dysfunction. And uh, of course, the need of reoperation within eight years is higher with the endoscopic procedures when we compare with open prostatectomies. Um, of course, the lasers, as Kevin mentioned, is an excellent option. I think that's the, obviously the penetration of a lab during the last 25 years has been limited and he mentioned the reasons. And um, also it's difficult to master and the incidence of strictures, urethral strictures is important, additional to the stress urinary incontinence that he was mentioning. Um, what are the indications for robotic? Basically are the same indication for, that we have for open prostatectomy. Um, there's many studies that have shown that uh, open is compared to laparoscopic single prostatectomy. And of course, there have been some studies comparing laparoscopy to robotic, and they're found basically there's very similar results. Also, there have been some pedotative uh, outcomes between robotic and laparoscopic symbrostectomy. There's a multi analysis and also showing that uh, very similar results between robotic and laparoscopy. Um, and basically, I want to show you here that basically the indications, one indication is when we have um, concomitant procedures. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a case with a big uh, prostate that also have the bladder that's uh, full of stones. And I think that's a, it's a good option that uh, we go laparoscopically. And then after removing all these stones, this was when we did a laparoscopy. Um, another option is that when you have, for example, this is a um, inguinal hernia where the bladder had sliding and has stones in the uh, bladder hernia. And then we're, we're doing the hernia repair. And then of course, we're bringing all these stones in and then we're doing uh, addition to remove these stones, we're doing the uh, adenomectum. Other indications, of course, if you have a huge bladder diverticulums and BPH, you know it's a nice procedure how you can do robotically uh, diverticulectum. Basically, uh, Robotic simple prostatectomy has been duplicating the open approach. It's nothing new. Uh, what we did in 2008 when we did the first description was that um, initially Mirandolino Mariano from Brazil, he did the laparoscopy uh, report. He was doing a vertical incision. And what we did is that we did a transverse incision in the bladder. The same incision that you do for a radical prostatectomy. We was not doing a milling incision because if you extend the transverse incision in the capsule, you go directly to the lateral pedicles. And of course, you had more chance of bleeding. And then after we do the incision, then we go exactly in the, in the posterior bladder neck. And then we start from the midline laterally. And then we do basically all that swiping maneuver, finding the cap, the adenoma. And then we was using at that time this like this suture like a fishing maneuver and then we put the the um, the suture through the adenoma and then we we do the retraction uh, nowadays we use the tenaculum instrument uh, and it's easier to do it but we was doing that uh, swiping maneuver because we don't have the, the dissector that we did laparoscopically to find the correct plane at the end it's very important that we need to put some sutures in the lateral pedicles and very important that we need to check because you can have some time bleeding that you don't see it because the pneumo, and then you can have postoperative bleeding. That was 2008. And then we did also some uh, trigonization. We bring the bladder mucosa to the prostatic fossa, same thing as open. 
And then, and then we just close uh, the capsule. And then this is a video showing the uh, standard technique that uh, we can use some retraction stitches to help when big adenomas. We can use the hook and you see how I'm, I'm doing some wet clips. And you can see exactly the swiping maneuver. And um, sometimes you, you can just um, do it and piecemeal the adenoma and remove one lobe and then the other one. And you see exactly that you can perfectly do this swiping maneuver and then you can perfectly get inside the adenoma and you see I'm preserving the prostatic capsule in this case. And then as I mentioned, sometimes you need to remove one. You see perfectly how you can peel the capsule from the adenoma and with the hook. It's, it's very nice how you can find the correct plane. After you remove the adenoma, of course, you do this kind of trigonization, bringing the mucosa of the bladder to the prostatic fossa or bringing to the posterior edge of the urethra. And you see with the bipolar, I'm doing perfectly hemostasia, but after I remove the adenoma, I put some sutures and I'm using now the tenaculum you see there. And a good thing also, you can change the tenaculum from one arm to the left arm. I'm removing here first the left lobe. And then after I remove one, it's easy to remove the right one. Here's how we use the tenaculum. This is one of the example that sometimes you need to piecemeal in order to remove median lobe, left side and right side. In 2012, uh, Rafael Coelho with Bips group they come with the idea because they was trying to see if they can do a complete reconstruction. And they was bringing the bladder, basically the bladder mucosa, but they was doing like this into interception, bringing the bladder in order to do the anastomosis. Uh, that was interesting because of course, you will not need to do any irrigation after, but uh, of course, if you have any cancer and you're bringing the prostatic bladder neck inside the prostatic capsule is going to be more difficult if you need to do additional treatment. Or if you have regrow of the tissue, it's going to be more difficult if you want to try to do any endoscopic treatment for that. Then uh, in 2013, we was exploring the idea of doing a, a really intrafascial, simple prostatectomy, removing the whole prostate, preserving the seminal vesicles, preserving all the fascias, and doing a complete bladder anastomosis. And that's what we do here. We was transecting the seminal vesicles, preserving all the fascias, uh, and then leaving a long urethra stump, and then doing anastomosis, and then doing an anterolateral reconstruction. That was in 2013. Then, uh, this is exactly how we was doing the intrafascial dissection is like a radical intrafascial, but preserving seminal vesicles. And of course, you can leave a big, but you see how you preserve all the fascias. I'm just gonna speed the video a little bit here. And you see perfectly that basically I'm peeling all the fascias of the prostate. And at the end, basically, you want to see that I'm leaving a long uh, urethra stump. And at the end, you want to see that I'm doing the anastomosis and you see perfectly all the bundle and all the fascias are preserved. And then after the anastomosis, I'm doing an anterolateral uh, reconstruction. In 2014, uh, Monish, and, and Leslie came with the idea of uh, doing what they call transvesical robotic simple prostatectomy was uh, of doing a posture incision, vertical incision in the bladder. And after you open the bladder, going inside the bladder and doing the enucleation. And after that, in 2016, Daniel Eun uh, also came with the idea of doing a complete uh, vesicle urethral anastomosis, what they call the 360 reconstruction. Is not only removing the adenoma, is bringing all the mucosa down to the urethra and then closes, closing the longitudinal cystotomy. And last year in December, uh, the B. Patel's group uh, came and they present um, what they call modified simple prostatectomy. It's basically the intrafascial uh, dissection that we described in 2015. 
and is basically have a full nerve bilateral preservation with an intrafascial plane dissection with minimal apical dissection and semical vesicle sparing and a full vesicle urethral anastomosis. I want to show this, um, I want to show some numbers uh, that I feel is important to get in this discussion. Uh, in 2015, uh, when we first uh, did a compare study, I was doing a comparison between the same surgeon, but I was doing laparoscopy adenomectomy, and then I was doing robotic prostatectomy, but I was doing standard adenomectomy, the technique that I described, and also I was doing, I was doing intrafascial technique. Here, I'm just putting the 75 patient that was described in that paper of the intrafascial technique. And I wanna compare to the 34 patient that Beep described in December last year. And I have here some preliminary numbers that we have not published yet, but we're working at USC now, that basically I'm comparing the intrafascial technique that I'm doing now at USC, the same technique, and some of the numbers of Dr. Gill that he's doing this uh, transvesical posture approach. And then I'm going to start making some comments first here. Uh, when, in 2015, when I report the first, these 75 patients, it's very interesting that um, uh, the, uh, I just want to show some of the, um, some interesting numbers. First is that how many of these patients has a previous biopsy before the adenomectomy? Uh, in my case, in Venezuela was 51% of the patient has a previous biopsy. In B. patels, um, oh, he had 59, uh, of the 50, 59% of the patient has a uh, previous biopsy. It means 20 of the 34 patient has a previous uh, biopsy before the adenomectomy. In, in USC, I have 50% of my patient has had a previous biopsy. And Dr. Gill's patients, uh, 68 patient of, the, of, of, of his patient has a previous uh, prostate biopsy. Basically, you can see when we compare here, uh, uh, the prostate volume uh, of um, Beep's patient is like 145 grams, and Dr. Gill is 141, mine is 180, 180 grams. And basically, they are very similar. Uh, the important here is that this finding that in what I found initially that caused my attention is that 22% of the patients, when I did intrafascial, I found cancer. In 17 uh, patients, it means 22% of the patients. Interesting that Beeps reports 50% of the patients that he did intrafascial uh, dissection, he found cancer. Um, that's really high for, for my opinion, but of course, he was reporting these patients, uh, these 34 patients, in a, in a mean range of 10 years. And some of these patients had a traditional sex second biopsy and was not an MRI guide fusion biopsies. And maybe that's why the high incidence of cancer that he's found in with the intrafascial dissection. But now uh, at USC, I have found 27% uh, of the patients doing intrafascial dissection, I found prostate cancer. And I have done 50% of these patients had already had previous biopsy, and we're going to review exactly the ones that had previous biopsy. In Dr. Gill's patient, of the 82 patients, 13 patients, it means 50%, like 16%, they have uh, found prostate cancer. Uh, important, in the BIPS patients of these 17 patients with prostate cancer, uh, 13 of them was glycine 6. Two of them is glycine 3 plus 4, and two of them is glycine 4 plus 3. In my 14 patients, nine are glycine 6, two are glycine 3 plus 4, two are 4 plus 3, and one is 4 plus 4. In Dr. Gill's patients, fives are 3 plus 3, seven are 3 plus 4, and one is 4 plus 5. From the patients that had cancer, it's important that three of my patients has positive margins. Uh, one was glycine six and two was glycine, one was three plus four margin and the other one was four plus four. In Dr. Gill patient, three of these 13 patients, one was glycine six, the other one was glycine three plus four and one was glycine four plus, four plus five. If we review exactly uh, it, the patient with prostate cancer that had previous negative biopsy, specifically the ones that got biopsy, you can see, for example, that uh, of BIPs, 
of the 20 patients that have a negative biopsy, 10 had prostate cancer. It means 50% of the prostates that are supposed to have negative biopsy, it came with cancer. In my, in my patients, 23% of the patients that are supposed to have negative biopsy, they came with prostate cancer, even had a uh, prostate biopsy. In Dr. Kills, um, from the 57 uh, patients that have negative biopsy, eight came with cancer in the final pathology. Another important point here is the percent of tissue removed. Of course, if you do intrafascial dissection, you get more tissue removed. It depends who's doing the ultrasound. It depends if it's measured by ultrasound or it's measured by CT scan. Um, not necessary. you're gonna remove the 100% tissue because if the ultrasound was not exactly or was done for a different person, it's not necessary. Really. But you can see obviously that if you do intrafascial dissection, you get like 90% of the tissue removed. In my initial study, it was 98%. In the transvesical, you only remove 60% of the tissue. Of course, when we do intrafascial dissection, first thing we're thinking is that we may be overtreating. Even that we have, I'm, I'm showing you the risk of patients that even having negative biopsy, they could have cancer, and the cancer not necessarily is going to be insignificant. Is also that, of course, we need to be very careful offering this option because we have to be careful about urinary continence and about erections. Even that the mean of all these patients in BIPs and or patients was like 70 years old, erection was not exactly the major reason, but continence is important. Uh, initially, when I report my 75 patients, uh, uh, of course, depend also the definition of continence. In my case, it was patient without pads. In one month, 57%, it means 76% of the patient was continent, and six months, 84% uh, of the patient, and at one year, 96% of the patient was continent without need of any pads. In Bib's uh, paper, he, he shows that 80% of the patients are continent at two months, but the definition of continence, it mentions, uh, he include Incontinence, if the patient use one pad for security reasons, is also included as continent. Of course, depend what definition you use. Uh, in these cases that we're doing at USC, we don't have that cases already um, completed. We're reviewing that. Uh, for us, that's uh, something that we're doing very meticulous because we feel that it's gonna be very important information that we review exactly if there's any difference in the continence and the potency at three months of these two techniques. Also, when I did my first patient, I also reviewed the, uh, uh, the IPS score and I reviewed also the SHIM score. It's also important that we need to mention and I think that's something that we need to review in the future. Some of other topics, other ways that we have explored to do the simple prostatectomy is the um, transvesical, what we call the single port and it was initially in me here came with the idea. We, was, we did the first single port through the umbilical bottom a belly button, and then we here come with the idea, why don't you put the port inside the bladder? And then we came with the idea doing the adenomectomy uh, through the bladder and with this port. And then we open the port and we remove the specimen. I mentioned this because this is something that's gonna be revisited now with the new platform of the robot. And that's, that's what also was done robotically, the transvesical single port um, enucleation of the prostate with the evolution of the SP, and now available on the market, I feel that it's gonna be revisited that they're gonna put the port in the bladder and they're gonna do the enucleation through the bladder with the single port robot. In conclusion, the robotic simple prostatectomy is a safe and effective treatment. The use of robotic, of course, overcome the limitation of the laparoscopy, pure laparoscopy. Uh, the learning curve is short, shorter than transuretral enucleation and robotic simple prostatectomy has a decreased risk of transfusion, complication, and mean length of state is relative uh, in different areas in compared to open, but we consistent lower operative times, of course, and is higher in cost. With that, Mihir, I think we can make some discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Rene. And so we have a few minutes left for um, some questions. So I'd like to start off by asking Kevin. Kevin, you, you're uniquely positioned and having been an expert with the various laser uh, ablative and uh, enucleation techniques, um, aquablation, robotic uh, techniques for prostatectomy. 
going forward 2022 and beyond you know assuming we have access to all technologies and reimbursement is not an issue how do you see um, the relative use of this pan out it's a deep rooted question and i'll try to be brief in my answer but i think we i think as a community uh, speaking on the nucleation aspect uh, the biggest issue even by virtue of peter gilling starting off with the aquablation i think it is a technique it is a great technique. It's endoscopic, exactly the idea of a nucleation that uh, we saw with robotics. Uh, that would be the holy grail, but it hasn't taken off. It's not applied into residency training programs. It's not something that's uniformly taught, uh, requires additional equipment. And from the reimbursement, it doesn't pull people to want to do this. That being said, as we move forward, creeping into the picture as well, which we did not talk about, are other techniques like Resume or other uh, modalities which are being looked at in the resume excel for 80 gram plus which are also seeming to have positive results so what can we move toward especially in the moments of covid what can we do more in the office i think that's our holy grail something in the office is the ultimate goal that's an outpatient procedure that's where we should aim for but in time now maybe in the next five years looking aside at costs and and, and reimbursement factors I definitely think, you know, speaking, having experience with aquablation, there is that naturalness, you know, uh, to something that as uh, Prokhar Desgupta once nicely said, I love quoting it, it democratizes the urologist. So, you know, if you've got tons of years of experience doing uh, a nucleation, as you pointed out in the Water 2 series, people did four or five cases of one day learning of the equipment that should B, I think our next uh, ultimate goal of uniforming, let's just say my dad's here with me, he needs BPH surgery, everyone on this phone call, everyone does whatever they do. We know with great, uns with great, uncert with great certainty, the variability in the outcomes are going to be all over the map. So it's our best little secret because we do something in the prostate, it could be 20 minutes, we know people who do a 20 minute TERP, I get paid well, the guy goes home, we just need to open up the prostate a bit, the IPSS improves, everyone's happy. So unfortunately, uh, that is something where if we can move forward in a, uniform, in a way to uniform the procedure across the globe, I think that would be helpful. However, as I was kind of summarizing my talk, that the need now is more than ever to personalize. We need to really sit down with our patient and find out, is ejaculation important if you're 80 years old? Do we really need to remove the whole transition zone if you're a 91-year-old gentleman in retention? Can we just treat the floor, get them to urinate, and, uh, and get them going uh, for the remainder of their life. And I think that's the difficult aspect and we have so many tools to choose from. So moving forward, I'd like to see something that's easily teachable, that residents and anyone out in practice, community or academic can tackle the large prostates. So until then, I think people are gonna start, you know, until we get everyone doing trust ultrasound so they know, and Renee, I'm sure on the phone, Mahir, you see a lot of patients who get referred to you and it's, oh, it's a 50 gram prostate and you do your ultrasound, it's 200 grams. Am I right? Yeah. I saw Renee's baby that he pulled out in his hand. I mean, I would wonder what the referring, refer, referring urologist sent for that patient, but that's key one. And then next key is getting past the turp and making sure that we have more urologists, not just using the hammer, that using other tools. So it's a tough question for you. Question for you. So going forward, uh, do you see any role for robotic simple prostatectomy? So I did cover that. So yeah, I think if you, as Renee mentioned, if you have a you know 400 gram prostate, I don't think no, you should no, be let's, doing... let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about a 100, 120, 130 uh, gram prostate. You know, of course the 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 extremes. Uh, we're not talking about that. But 100 to 120, 130 gram prostate, any role. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be familiar with your environment and your tools. If you can do an excellent surgery with, uh, you know, quick recovery and good outcomes, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It just, if you don't have the skill set to do a hole up and you feel comfortable and you uh, have good access, another thing in Canada is access to. So I have a limited number of cases and I'm doing cancer. I can't just say I'm going to put a BPH case on and make cancer patients wait longer. So it advises the environment, your skill set, and then from a cost analysis, if it works out. Um, and uh, explaining to the patients that this is an option, but the downside is there's going to be in skin incisions. You'll tend to have a catheter a bit longer. So I definitely yeah. think there's a rule. Um, and if I said it's like an 80 gram or a hundred gram, well, you know, that's then the splitting hairs, what's best. And, uh, but definitely no I, question about it. And nucleation is great. Robotics is great. 
but if you're doing I like here, you're, what kind of volumes are you doing a, a week? I mean, your volumes per week probably matched some other urologist community doing that per year. What, what's your opinion you are, about, about the stress incontinence that they can have in the enucleations? So absolutely. I think that's a, and that's why I brought it in because I think that's a downside, especially with standard uh, techniques of where they split the five and six and the apical, there was a lot more traction. We become co uh, cognizant of that. And some of the green lights I'm doing now uh, for green lap, I'm actually creating my initial incision, kind of like what we do for aqua ablation. I move, move it back a centimeter or two and to protect not just the, uh, the vera montana, but the ducts that go through that. So like, kind of like the idea, if you spare the ureteric orifice, but I take a TURBT and I go above the orifice lateral, I may get the orifice and in this sense, the ducts that are going to impact ejaculation. So by doing that, we're able to preserve better ejaculation. And the other factor is I'm able to preserve a collar of tissue that's going to preserve this in, uh, incontinence. So when I've done green light, it's bladder neck toward apex. For an enucleation, you must start at the apex. So that's how we were taught. And you are jimmying like, a, like you're trying to break into someone's car and that's we call it hole up, but it's really, I call it stored step. It's the storts mechanical separation, and it's later the enucleation or the morselation that really treats the BPH. Uh, but yes, the transient incontinence can't be unforget, uh, unspoken. And I, I like to give a little punch out sometimes with the nucleation people, they call it transient because three months and six months of incontinence is not transient. Do you see any future for morselation, any new toy? I think the piranha with the disposable blades is hard to beat. I mean, you can get any, like up to 100 grams of adenoma tissue re removed relatively quick, but then you're adding an additional cost, um, especially the, the, the display, the way it works underneath. It's really hard to, to suck in the bladder unless you let everything drain out. So the bladder injury rate has been much lower. Um, do I see a new tool for that? I, I, I don't. Uh, it's going to be hard to beat that, but... Ultimately, it'd be nice to see something that can do that at the same time, because unless you're like a, like a, I'm comparing to my good old days of like WWF wrestling, where you had a tag team partner, let's just say, you know, uh, Indy does the morsel, nucleation and you come and do the morselation. That's the, that's what makes it long in the past that, you know, you're tired, you're, you spend an hour. And I say, I think the human brain has about an hour of focus, but once you get into the second and third hour of surgery, you tend to be, uh, you know, not paying attention. And I think that's where some of those morselation injuries occur because you're kind of like driving a long car drive. You just get into the morselating and all of a sudden you got some bladder on you. And unfortunately the bladder wall of five or six millimeters doesn't have a lot of reservoir. And next thing you know, you're in danger. So I think Kevin, you were being polite in, in your answer to my question. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, you know, there are residents uh, listening to this and uh, I guess my question to you and Meher is, we are talking best in class. We are talking all techniques, technologies, skills are available, and we are talking best in class. So my question again is, for a 100, 120 gram prostate, and question to you and Mihir, um, is there any rationale? Of course, diverticulum, stone, forget all that stuff. Just talking 120 gram prostate, any rationale for going robotically? Because you know, at the end of the day, going robotically, which is what we do, uh, I feel as, I personally feel as second best. I mean, we are making incisions, we are cutting the bladder, the catheter stays for a week, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, is not minimally morbid. Any role for doing anything other than transurethral uh, in the best of class uh, for 120 so, plus. So my, my feeling is that this is going to be a, 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 a moving target. I think what has happened is, I think HOLEP or any trans enucleation has been limited primarily by the fact that the, you're basically doing the enucleation with a beak of a cystoscope and using some energy to get hemostasis. And as the gland gets bigger and as you go towards the bladder neck, you tend to get disoriented. So it's telling to me, for example, that you know Peter Gilling described this almost 25, 30 years ago. And yet, if you look at the number of enucleations done in North America, they're less than 3%. So unless you trained in Montreal or Indiana or Mayo, Arizona, you are not doing any HOLEP. So it's not available um, uh, for the, and it takes uh, uh, not just time. And I've talked to, for example, uh, Pierre Huber, who trained with Kevin in, in Montreal and had probably the best exposure to HOLEPs as a resident, said not having done HOLEPs for two years during his robotics fellowship, he now feels hesitant. So I asked him, at, at, in, in your practice, he was trained here doing robotics. He was trained doing HOLEPs. What do you do? And, and mostly he does robotic simple prostate. So 
Holeb, I think, will still be a, a, a very important modality for the anticoagulant patients. We should not forget that there is a huge population of these BPH patients who are either on or need to be restarted very quickly. And I don't think that there is, in the current tool milieu, uh, a, a better option than a laser-based procedure. These patients tend to be sicker, so the increased invasiveness of pneumoperitoneum and transperitoneal access is going to be uh, a, a challenge. But currently, uh, residents are more likely to be comfortable in the robotic environment than they are likely to be comfortable in the uh, enucleation environment. And uh, it's, it is a difficult thing to learn. There, are, there was an interesting study from Germany where a dedicated center, five centers, started a program in a systematic fashion. Four of the five discontinued it in a year. So obviously there is a, a, a very, very... Uh, 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 yeah. So, so it is. It is a. It is a. It is a difficult thing to learn. But I, I think if you are willing to undergo the mentorship that Kevin mentions, where you really spend time watching it, have the person come over, and you have a referral base of doing a significant volume of high vol large prostates, maybe start off with the 60, 70 gram prostate and then gradually go up. Then I think that it is clearly less invasive than a simple prostatectomy. I think. Uh, but I, I do feel that the challenge is going to be with these newer technologies, which may not remove as much adenoma as your enucleations do. Maybe they're going to have a higher retreatment rate, similar to what the ablative or resection techniques have, uh, but they will be able to be done by everybody in the community. That is what I think will sell a resume or a Eurolift or an aquablation is because anybody can do it. And it is the, the outcomes are consistent. While with Holep, the, uh, uh, Kevin doing a Holep, outstanding outcomes, but you can have somebody who's not uh, uh, comfortable doing it, where you, you know, enucleate one lobe, you get into bleeding, you stop, you enucleate the other lobe, then you go back to, it can be a very complex, morbid uh, uh, procedure. So I think that will stay clearly with the experienced people as well as for the anticoagulant patients. I think robotic simple prostates will evolve towards patients with, which Rene has mentioned, uh, the intrafascial technique, maybe for the patients who have low risk prostate cancer with BPH, where they want to get their BPS treated, but they're not really keen on doing a very aggressive uh, uh, prostate cancer management. The intrafascial technique may be a good compromise or with a significant number of associated things like diverticulized stones, et cetera, hernias, which is not uncommon in this population, again, where the robotics will be. But I, I do feel that from a volume and penetrance standpoint, uh, uh, techniques like Eurolift, and if Eurolift can figure out the, and they are, uh, the median lift, median lobe uh, quandrum and and resume is coming in for larger prostate. It is office-based. Aquablation, if they can figure out their hemostasis to be more consistent, then these will clearly in the community, as BPH is a community disease, and we probably will find less referrals of the 120 grammar to a tertiary care center because these can now be effectively treated in the community by uh, standardized techniques. So I think, I think Indy wanted us to say yes or no. Is there a role? <laughs> I want to... I, and I, I just to sum up, I think there is still a role, and especially if I can add, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not here. To, it was a tough thing to try and sell a nucleation. It was 20 years of tried, and it hasn't caught on. And outside of being from what I call the disciples and the, you know, the the Padawans from the metastases from certain centers of, as you mentioned, there's three or four. That's how you learn hole up or a nucleation. Um, but unfortunately, you know, fortunately, and amongst the hundred different U.S. programs, every resident is learning to do robotic prostatectomy. So when you move from a robotic radical to a simple, it's not much of a, of a change and shift and you have the equipment and you're comfortable and that's what you need, equipment and comfort, and then you can do it again, uh, reproducibly, even if your numbers are small. So I think there's that role outside of someone who, who wants to do that training where they have a robot, there'll be a role for it. But the question is, how many people are doing ultrasounds and know how big their prostates are? And uh, that's, that's step one. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, compliments. Uh, our team's compliments to you for your leadership in the field and uh, really uh, pushing this forward and setting a bar. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you for coming and uh, uh, being in part of our 60 Minutes. This will be uh, hosted on our YouTube uh, channel, USC Urology YouTube channel, which now has over, you know, uh, 1,300 subscribers and over 10,000 visits, etc. Uh, Rene, Meher, outstanding work, guys. We just need to improve our transurethral presence is what I was trying to get at. I was trying to be self-critical that we are not state of the art and cutting edge if we cannot offer everything transurethrally. So thank you all and uh, have a great evening. Thank you.
拜拜。